We're talking about how to solve parabolic partial differential equations using finite difference methods. In the previous video, we looked at explicit methods, which provide a very straightforward way to get approximate solutions at each time step as we march forward in time, delta t by delta t. But we found that there is an issue with numerical stability. So we want to address how we do the numerical stability analysis in this video and the next video. You'll remember for elliptic boundary value problems, the issue is iterative convergence rate. So we're doing an iterative process over and over again until that iterative process converges. And so we first want to know whether it was going to converge and then of course how fast it's going to converge. How many iterations is it going to take? In parabolic partial differential equations or initial value problems, we have a different concern. The concern now is numerical stability. So we're no longer iterating. Instead, we're marching in time. And the question is, Every time you obtain a new approximate solution at each time step, you're introducing additional round off errors. You're essentially perturbing the system by a tiny little bit. And the question is, what does the numerical algorithm itself do with those tiny perturbations? If the errors decay, then it is stable. If the errors grow and become larger, then it is unstable. So we're going to look at how we can analyze the numerical stability of our numerical algorithms. You'll remember that for the first order explicit method, I gave you the criteria for stability. S had to be less than or equal to a half. And we're going to show here where that result comes from. There are three approaches to performing numerical stability analysis. Matrix methods are the most rigorous approach because they evaluate the stability of every aspect of the scheme, including the treatment of boundary conditions. It's also the most difficult because it involves calculating the eigenvalues of a very large matrix. So it's the most rigorous, but it's also the most difficult. The most common form of numerical stability analysis is known as the von Neumann method. It's based on a Fourier analysis, but it's only applicable to linear initial value problems with constant coefficients. So this is more restrictive than the matrix method. If you do have a nonlinear problem, then you need to linearize it first before you can do the numerical stability analysis. It does not account for boundary conditions, so it's not as rigorous as the matrix method, but it does give us guidance. So the actual stability criteria might be a little different than what we get from a von Neumann analysis, but it'll give us good guidance in terms of these stability criteria. It is much easier to perform in general than matrix methods. So this is the most commonly used approach. So nine times out of 10, if someone says they did a numerical stability analysis, more often than not, that's been done using the von Neumann method, this Fourier approach. So we're gonna discuss in this video the matrix method. It's relatively simple conceptually. It's just hard to get all the eigenvalues. And then in the next video, we'll look at the von Neumann method, which is the more common approach. There is a third approach known as the modified wave number analysis approach. And that's based on results that we have for stability of ordinary differential equations. So we can extend those ODE stability properties to corresponding partial differential equations in both time and space. So if you already have a result for a corresponding ODE, then you can extend it using this approach to a PDE. We're not gonna focus on this approach here because it's specific to those certain types of problems. So the matrix method. So let's imagine that we have the exact solution of our difference equation. Obviously we don't. That's why we're trying to approximate it numerically. But let's just pretend that we do. We'll call that u hat. So u i n hat is the exact value at x is equal to x i and t is equal to t n of the solution of our difference equation. Then we can define an error. The error will be the difference between the numerical approximation that we have as we march forward in time and this exact solution of the same difference equation. So that's the error e i n. Now for the first order explicit method that we looked at in the previous video, our difference equation looked like this. Remember we had an explicit expression for u i n plus one, n plus one being the next time level at which we don't know the solution in terms of values of u all at n for which we do know the solution, the previous time step. So it was one minus two s all times u i n plus s times the quantity u i plus one plus u i minus one. And remember here that s is alpha delta t over delta x squared. Obviously delta x is, this, is the spatial grid size, delta t is the time step, and alpha is the diffusivity, which is a physical parameter for the particular problem that we're looking at. Let's suppose for now that we just have Dirichlet boundary conditions at both ends of the domain. Now because u and u hat both actually come from solutions of the difference equation, they both, of course, satisfy the difference equation. 
they are not the same, but they both satisfy the difference equation. Therefore, if that's the case, then the error has to satisfy that same difference equation as well. So we can simply replace the u's with e's here. So ein plus 1 is equal to the right-hand side with the u's replaced with e's. Now, if we do have Dirichlet boundary conditions on both ends, we know the value of u at both ends, and therefore the e would be 0. The error would be 0 at 1 and a capital I plus 1. Now, we can write this in matrix form. This is not the way we actually solve it, but we can write it in this way in order to do the numerical stability analysis. So on the left-hand side, we have the error vector. On the right-hand side, we also have an error vector. And then we have a coefficient matrix that has the coefficients on those error terms. So it's going to look like this. We have en plus 1 is equal to a matrix A times the vector en. The ens are known from the previous time step. We are looking for the errors at the next n plus first time step. And then the A is the coefficient matrix. So we can imagine going from one time step to the next by simply doing this pre-multiplication with this matrix A. Okay, so E then is just all of the unknown E's. It's the E's in the interior, 2 through capital I, because at 1 and capital I plus 1, we know the values from the Dirichlet boundary conditions. Now A, we have the 1 minus 2S down the main diagonal, and then we have S and S on the upper and lower diagonals. This is specific to this particular situation. The first order explicit method applied to the 1D unsteady diffusion equation. You change anything about what I just said, and you change the matrix A. But in this case, you'll notice that this is a Toeplitz matrix, because it has the same values along the diagonal, and it's tridiagonal. We only have the three diagonals, which have non-zero values. Everything else is zero. OK, so keep that in mind. The criteria in order for our numerical method to be stable is that the spectral radius, which is the largest eigenvalue by magnitude of this matrix A, has to be less than or equal to 1. Now, why is that? It's the same argument that we made in iterative techniques applied to elliptic problems. Totally different scenario, iteration versus time marching. However, in both cases, we can write the iterative process or the time marching process in terms of a matrix problem. So because of that, if you follow the same proof as we did in the iteration case, we come up with the result that the spectral radius, the magnitude of all of the eigenvalues of, in this case, A, have to be less than or equal to 1. Now there's capital I minus 1 such eigenvalues corresponding to the size of the matrix problem that we need to solve. Now what you realize from this is it only takes one of us to ruin it for everyone. So if all of the eigenvalues are less than or equal to 1, except for 1, that's all it takes. Just one unstable mode, and the whole thing goes kablooey. So there's a life lesson there as well. OK, so now we know, because this is a tridiagonal matrix that happens to be toplets, we already know what the eigenvalues are. We had these from section 3.5 way back. So the lambdas are 1 minus 4s times sine squared of j pi over 2i. You'll notice I'm using j here to go from 1 to capital I minus 1, because we're shifting due to the boundary conditions. So if the magnitudes of the lambdas all have to be less than or equal to 1, that's the same as saying they have to be between minus 1 and 1. So we have these inequalities that we have to satisfy in order for our numerical method to be numerically stable. Well, the s here is always positive. That's alpha delta t over delta x squared. That's always positive. Sine squared is always positive. And so 1 minus a positive number is always going to be less than 1. So the right inequality is satisfied for any positive value of s. And again, s has to be positive. So that leaves us with the left inequality that we need to check for. So that says that 1 minus 4s times sine squared of j pi over 2 cap i has to be greater than or equal to minus 1. So let's see what this says about s. If I subtract 1 from both sides to get rid of this, and then I have a minus 2 on the right, and if I divide by minus 4 on both sides, then I get s sine squared is less than or equal to a half. Remember, when you divide by a negative number, you have to switch the direction of the inequality. So the greater than or equal to becomes a less than or equal to. Now sine is always between minus 1 and 1. Sine squared then is always between 0 and 1. 
So s, which is positive, times sine squared, which is positive, and the largest value that the sine squared can take on is 1. That tells us that s has to be less than or equal to a half. If you need to think about the logic there, just pause the video and go back. Listen to the argument very carefully that justifies this. So the s, which is alpha delta t over delta x squared, has to be less than or equal to a half. For the Euler method, with Dirichlet boundary conditions, apply to the 1D unsteady diffusion equation. So it is conditionally stable. There are only certain conditions for which it's stable. There's other conditions for which it's unstable. And remember what that effectively means is once we choose our spatial grid size, the delta x, this effectively gives us a limitation on what the time step can be. Remember the alpha is pretty small. The delta x of course is small. You square that, it gets even smaller. So this was a restriction on delta t. And normally the restriction on delta t for stability is more restrictive than the restriction on delta t for numerical accuracy as we discussed in the previous video. We will want to be able to address how can we improve on these methods in terms of their numerical stability properties. Now here this was pretty straightforward because it was a tridiagonal matrix, toplets, and we have exact values of the eigenvalues. That's not normally the case. So normally you're gonna have this giant A matrix for which you need to obtain all of the eigenvalues and check that they're all by magnitude less than or equal to one. So this is a very computationally intensive operation. Now the A matrix does take into account the boundary conditions. Now one other thing you'll notice is that the number of grid points I will affect the eigenvalues. Therefore, the grid size, everything else being the same, the grid size can, in general, influence the numerical stability properties. Okay, this last slide is actually really important. I wanna contrast the elliptic case to the parabolic case, because there are some important similarities that lead to a suggestion of how we might solve elliptic problems more efficiently. So follow the, the logic. So in terms of elliptic problems, we have our matrix form of the iterative process. You have the previous value of the iteration, remember n, n plus one here in this context represents the iteration number by pre-multiplying by m and adding this term, that's just a vector, you get a new approximation for the new iterate. In order for that to converge, the spectral radius has to be no bigger than one for the iterative procedure. The issue, however, is that in elliptic techniques where we're iterating like this, it's not just a matter of whether it's going to converge when we iterate. We care about how effective that iteration process is going to be. So if I have to iterate a thousand times instead of a hundred times, well, I'm waiting 10 times as long. So we care about the spectral radius being less than one in order for it to converge, but we also care about how much less than one in order to determine the rate of convergence. And that was the whole motivation for going from Jacobi to gauss seidel to SOR to ADI, multigrid and so forth. That's what drove all of that discussion. Here, for parabolic problems, things are similar in the sense that numerical stability is based on these eigenvalues of this giant matrix. However, the difference is there is no such thing as a method being more stable than another. It's either stable or it's unstable. So if it's stable, that's all we care about. There's no practical value of the row being much less than one. So as long as it's less than or equal to one, and it will give us a stable solution. So what that suggests to us is the following. If what I really want to solve is an elliptic PDE, such as Laplace's equation, that brings me back up to here, where I want the row to be as small as possible. Not just less than one, but as small as possible. But why not reframe that same problem as an unsteady heat conduction problem. So partial u partial t is equal to del squared u. It's still the heat conduction equation, it's just the unsteady form. For this form, we would use a parabolic method, as we're talking about now, and we are only subject to numerical stability considerations. So why not use one of our time marching methods on this, and as it converges in time towards a steady solution, we then have our steady solution. And in fact, it turns out that in practice, this is the case. This is counterintuitive to turn a steady problem into an unsteady problem. We can get the steady solution faster than if we directly sought that steady solution for the reasons that we've just discussed. This is called the pseudo-transient method. So we're gonna make it a transient problem. We're gonna make it an unsteady problem, but we actually don't care about how it approaches that steady state. We just wanna do the calculation to get to that steady state. So you often see this done. 
people are solving steady elliptic problems you know wonder why why are we making the problem more difficult we're doing that because it actually may speed up the solution itself